Well, have you ever wondered why Jerusalem is so important? Not just in Bible history, but in world history. It is the most important, most fought over piece of real estate on the face of the earth. The phrase troubles in the Middle East, you can say that at any time, anywhere, during any season of history, and everybody will nod and go, oh yeah, the troubles in the Middle East. And those troubles are always around the city of Jerusalem. Well, today, we're going to give you a pretty decent idea of why that is the case in, um, in a fascinating portion of the book of Revelation. We're not even going to get through an entire chapter today, uh, 11, uh, Revelation 11, verses 1 through 14. So let's take a look at it. Revelation 11. But again, we're only going to get through uh, verses 1 through 14 today. We are still in the break between the trumpets 6 and 7. Six trumpets have blown. The seventh is not yet blown. So we're still in that time of, of peace and of break and other things going on. Um, so these are related, obviously, to the end times, but they are not directly related to Christ reclaiming of the earth. They're a break from that idea. So in the first 14 verses of this chapter, we're going to be looking at two subjects. Um, starting with verses 1 and 2, we're going to look at the temple of God, and we're going to look at the two witnesses. Don't worry about those two. They'll, you'll see them come up and, uh, as, as we go through. But first of all, the temple of God, in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. Here's how it begins. I was given a reed, I, of course, being John again, okay, the person who's, who's seeing and hearing and, and doing all of these things. Uh, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Holy city, temple, we know what we're talking about, right? Jerusalem. So let's show you what we're talking about. Let's go back to the illustration we saw earlier about the tabernacle in the wilderness. Two different words, tabernacle, temple. The difference between the words tabernacle and temple are this. This that I'm showing you now is an illustration of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was portable. The tabernacle was carried with the Hebrews through the desert. So you can see from the outside that it's, it's tied by ropes. From the inside, it's it's a tent. It was a tent, and it could be carried from place to place. And you can see how large it was, you know, over two, you know, maybe three, three, three football fields or more. Uh, oh, no, no, small. I'm sorry. I got to look at it the other way. Let's take a look at it. Let me illustrate it this way. Let me get that up there. So American football field, I was comparing this to this, but no, compare this to this. So it's very small, okay? Football field here. So what, three, maybe four of these could fit into a football field. So it was a very small place. And all of this was portable. It was picked up. It was moved. It was set up again. You can see by the bull and by the person here, the size of the entire thing, not extremely large. So that's the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place of worship that was portable while the Hebrews were wandering through the desert for 40 years. After they got into the land, the tabernacle was used until David looked out one day and said, hey, God, this is not fair. You're living in a tent. They built a palace for me. We've been in here for, for generations. I want to build you a temple. And so he built a temple, and the temple was a permanent place. So when we hear the word tabernacle, we mean the, the tent that was carried through the wilderness wanderings by the Hebrews. When we say the tabernacle, we mean the permanent version of the tabernacle, the temple. The temple is the permanent stone version of the tabernacle, and it was always much larger than that. And so let me show you an idea of how that goes. So this is the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness. Again, football field, the full size of this. You can see how small it was. When the tabernacle was built, there were a couple different tabernacles, but the tabernacle that existed when Jesus walked on the earth and shortly before, or maybe even around the time that John wrote Revelation, this was the inner court of the tabernacle. Let me take a look, go back here. This part right here, it was all behind this gate. So this big thing here was built to replace this. So, so you see, like the height of this is you know barely taller than a human being. Later on, they built this. Take a look at the people here. You've got to go through this gate to get into the main part of the tabernacle, and that central part was inside here. So it was a huge place. And if you think that's big, take a look at this. This is the tabernacle that Jesus entered, 
And the big part we saw in the earlier picture is just this. Let me go back again. So this entire thing is this. So the entire court of the tabernacle was huge. It was about the size of Chavez Ravine or of Angel Stadium and all of its parking lot. Over here, you've got the, the housing for the priests that were connected to the temple, but were not officially a part of the temple. So it's really almost a city within a city. In fact, back here, you would have had a lot of place where priests lived and so on, the entire area around it. It was really a city within a city. It was a really, really massive place. So why am I telling you this? Because when John was giving this illustration about the temple, the tabernacle, the picture that the typical Jew had in their mind when they read Revelation for the first time was this. This, this picture here, this picture here was the picture that they had in their heads. They knew there was a tabernacle that was just a, um, a tent in the desert, but the place they had been was this place that you're looking at right now. So the tabernacle was a tent in the wilderness. There were then four temples that were built, were built after that. After the tabernacle, there were four temples that the Bible mentions, that is physical permanent structures that were built in the middle of Jerusalem. And we'll talk about the location of that in a moment because that matters too. Solomon's temple, which was built after David prepared it and was built by Solomon. And we have, have that starting, we have that in 1 Kings. The second temple called Zerubbabel's temple, which happened after the Babylonian exile, just after the people come back. The last part of the story of the Old Testament actually happens in Ezra and Nehemiah, because after that it's prophecies. The story of the Old Testament ends with Nehemiah, and is it is the temple being built. And remember, if, if you're a, a Bible scholar, you may remember when the second temple was built, called Zerubbabel's temple, those who had remembered Solomon's temple wept because Zerubbabel's temple was so small. So Solomon's temple was massive and glorious. Zerubbabel's temple was built by exiles who had come back to the land again, didn't have much money, so it was much smaller. It was destroyed between the Testaments, and then Herod came along and he built a temple which was as big, maybe bigger than Solomon's temple. And that was the temple that we read about in John chapter 2, for instance, when Jesus says, I'll, I'll destroy this temple in three days, and right? And then he says, no, I'm talking about my temple, my body. But he did it in the middle of this massive temple that we just saw the picture of, that huge temple. Let me go back a second here. This here is, uh, is Herod's temple. This is the temple that Jesus walked through. This is the temple where the day of Pentecost happened. In fact, the day of Pentecost would have happened in out, this out, outside part here called the Court of the Gentiles. We'll get to it in a moment. So while I'm illustrating it, let me show it to you. So you've got, this is called Solomon's Porch, Solomon's Portico. And people would come in and they would have meetings over here in Solomon's Porch. On the day of Pentecost, they were probably gathering in an area way outside here in Solomon's Porch. So you could have uh, an event like the day of Pentecost happened over here, and over here, the people not even know that it was occurring. It was a massive place. Again, remember, think of it, this is one side of Chavez Ravine with Dodger Stadium in the middle and then the parking on the other side. And you can have something going on here that nobody knows about here, right? So a lot of things could happen here. This was called the Court of the Gentiles over here for the reason that Gentiles could come in. Anybody could come in here. So this is where they had a lot of their trade going back and forth. Right here at this gate was where Jesus overturned the money changers in the temple because what they were doing was they were requiring people at exorbitant rates to uh, change their Gentile money into Hebrew money so that they could come into the temple. And the poor people couldn't afford the rates and couldn't go in and worship God. So Jesus was upset that they were actually by by ripping people off, they were actually keeping Jewish people who wanted to come in here and worship God, they were actually keeping them from coming in and worshiping. Another story from another time, but this illustration shows you that. So this massive area called the Court of the Gentiles, remember this because we'll come back to it later, and then inside here is called the Court of the Jews. Only Jews could enter here. Actually, the uh, Court of the Women is what this was called because female, male and female Jews could enter here, and through this gate, into the spot here that was built as a, as a to resemble the tab tabernacle in the wilderness, only male Jews could come here. And then inside here, only the priests could come. And then inside the holy spot inside here was the holiest of holies 
where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, and only one time of the year could the high priest come in. So Gentiles, men and women, only male Jews, only priests, and then all the way on the inside, only one priest, one time a year to the Ark of the Covenant. So the closer you got in, the holier and holier and holier the place got. But you can see it's a massive, massive place. So I just love that. So I hope you enjoy that too, because to me, that's just a whole bunch of cool stuff. So for, so that's the third temple, Herod's temple. Then we've got the temple of the Antichrist that is mentioned. Now, this is the temple that's mentioned here. It says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple. Now, which temple? Probably by the time John wrote the book of Revelation, the temple had been destroyed. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. We know that for an absolute certainty from all kinds of archaeological evidence. John probably wrote Revelation in around the 90s. So the people who were alive at the time would have known about the temple, but it would not exist anymore. So when John says, I got to go measure the temple, everybody's going, well, it can't be the temple that we've known. It's gone, which means there's going to be another temple that comes at some point. All right. So what does it say about it? It says, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Now, what is he talking about? Let's go back again. Go in and measure all of this where Jewish worshipers are allowed to go, but do not measure the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. Now, again, it's not in this actual one because this is, and obviously it's not an actual picture of it. This is a, a model that's been made <laughs> recently. Not a lot of photographs from Herod's temple back in the first century. Okay, uh, so this is obviously a model of it, but a really good one, a really realistic looking one, right? So don't measure this part, the court of the Gentiles, only measure where the Jewish people can go. Why? Let's get to that in a moment. I know, complicated, but hopefully interesting stuff for you. I know I love it for sure. Now, what is going on here? Which temple is being measured? Right now, there's no temple. When John wrote it, there was no temple. So here's a clue. Matthew 24, 15 says this. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What does that have to do with the temple? Now, there was a prophecy in the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel 9.27, about something that was going to be called the abomination that causes desolation. It was immediately, or fairly immediately, about a time that actually happened in 150 AD. In 150 AD, a, a ruler of Syria, a king of Syria called Antiochus Epiphanes, came and desecrated the, the altar of the temple. He actually offered a pig to Zeus on the altar of the temple and poured the pig's blood over the scroll of the Torah, of the Bible. I mean, you cannot, you cannot cause greater desecration than that. And it was called the abomination that causes desolation. Because of that, because it had been desecrated, it caused desolation. It was a place you couldn't go in because now it had been it had been completely destroyed. It had been ruined by that. It is when the Jews then overtook Jerusalem again and overthrew the Syrians, what happened was they had to go in and they had to cleanse the temple again so that it was no longer desolate so that they could worship in it again. Again, Antiochus Epiphanes had done what? He had slaughtered a pig on the altar and had poured the pig's blood over the scroll of the scripture. That is no longer a holy place. So they went in after they defeated Antiochus Epiphanes, and they had to clean it up. And they cleaned it over eight-day period. And during that eight-day period, the oil that was only supposed to last a night lasted for the eight days of the cleansing. Anybody familiar with that story? It's the Hanukkah story. Yeah, the Hanukkah story comes directly from this abomination that causes desolation. It was Zerubbabel's temple. It, the holy place was desecrated. They went in to clean it, and it is the celebration of the cleansing of the temple after the original abomination of desolation that is celebrated at Hanukkah every year by Jewish friends. I, you may have to go back and listen to that one a couple times because there's a lot of complicated stuff in there, I know. So here's the deal. John comes, Matt, in Matthew, it's not John, it's Jesus speaking. And Jesus says, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through Daniel, then flee to the mountains. But wait a minute. 
By the time Jesus speaks about it in the first century AD, the abomination of desolation caused by Antiochus Epiphanes that is celebrated in Hanukkah had already happened about 200 years before that, which means the prophecy in Daniel has a double fulfillment. The original fulfillment, the original abomination of desolation, was the desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes of the altar. There is another one still to come. But that other one still to come, which will resemble in some way the original abomination that causes desolation, will have to happen in a new temple, because guess what? For 2,000 years, for almost 2,000 years, there has been no temple in Jerusalem. And it can't be an abomination that causes desolation if there's no temple. There's no temple to abominate. <laughs> okay? But Jesus is saying it's still coming. There's going to be a second one. And by the time John refers to it here, right, as a second temple that you're supposed to measure. So the, the temple that, that he says you need, you're going to measure is a, another temple that will be built and a temple that Jesus has already said will be desecrated. I know, a lot of stuff there, a whole bunch going on. Now you get why so many people get confused by Revelation and why there are so many theological disagreements about it. It's amazing, complicated stuff. But the bottom line of it is this. The temple will be built before or during the tribulation. Why do we know that? Because there's no temple now. There hasn't been one for almost 2,000 years. This is why anytime there's a hint that the Jews might be rebuilding the temple. It's a big thing in the, in the world of prophecy because before Jesus can return again, the temple has to be built. Now, pause here a second and go, oh, wait a minute, then, then we don't have to wait until the temple's built before the rapture? No, no, no. The rapture happens first at any moment, seven years later, as we'll get to soon, well, not soon, but as we'll get to before the book of Revelation is done, seven years after the the drawing up, the rapture, Jesus returns at the Battle of Armageddon. So the rapture and the second coming of Jesus are related but separate events. The rapture could happen before I finish this sentence. Okay, it didn't, right? <laughs> the rapture can happen at any second. We don't need a temple to have been built for the rapture to occur. The rap, the built, the temple can it just has to be built before the abomination of desolation, which probably happens at about the three and a half year point. So. Even if the rapture occurred now, they'd still have three and a half years to build a temple, which would be desecrated. Okay, again, complicated, interesting, challenging stuff, but I hope you're enjoying it. I love all this stuff. Okay, so what does it say in the passage we just read? The outer court is not to be measured. Why? You measure what you own. Remember when David got in trouble because he, he called for a census of the people? I want you to count my entire kingdom. And God said, you're in trouble for that? Why would he be in trouble for counting things? You count the things you own. David, by counting the kingdom, is going, this is my kingdom. I'm going to see how big it is so I can brag to the other kings. And God's going, no, it's not your kingdom. If I say don't measure it, you don't measure it. It's my stuff. And so what he says is, I'm going to, you're going to take a reed, a measuring stick. You're going, to, you're going to measure it because I own this. But you're only going to measure the inner court. Why? Because that's the Jewish court. That's where the Jewish people will be. This is God saying, I still, own, I still own the Jews. I'm still protecting the Jews. I'm still taking care of the Jews. And even during this season of time where evil will run around the earth, I still have the Jews as a special place in my heart. So the inner court will still be safe and special by God and, 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 um, and protected by God. The outer court which is which was in Jesus' day called the court of the Gentiles, where anybody could go in, the outer court will be a place of many religions for the first half of the tribulation. So it appears as though the outer court where Gentiles could go, but really only observant Gentiles, Gentiles who respected Judaism typically only went during Jesus' day, when the new temple is rebuilt, it will probably be rebuilt for some kind of big one-world religion, and probably in the outer court, non-Christian and pagan religions will probably celebrate, and, but on the inner court, it'll only be for Jews, and God will protect it as a place for Jews. How, why, specifics of that, don't really know. It's going to be interesting. But again, let's take a look at it. Actually, before we do that, let, let's take a look at this. How many of you have ever seen a, a, a photograph of Jerusalem? If you do, the most dominant part of a, any photograph of Jerusalem 
is this dome. It's called the Dome of the Rock. Right now, this dome, it, and for hundreds of years now, this dome has been uh, overtaken by and is owned by the Muslims. This is Muslim land right here, okay? The, the tabernacle that we showed you, and I'll show it to you again, this tabernacle here was built somewhere around here. Maybe here, maybe here, maybe here. We don't know exactly for sure, but Muslims believe that the rock that is under this dome is the place where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac when God saved Isaac from being sacrificed. That's why they believe this is so important. Most Jews believe that this is probably the place for it as well. That's one of the reasons why the temple was built there originally, because it was back to that spot. Okay? So this is, this is what that's believed to be. So the Muslims own this now. The Jews own, I think, this area here, but I'm not sure. But the tabernacle was put somewhere around here. I, the, the Muslims believe this is where um, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. I think that they and many Jews also believe that this is the spot where the holiest of holy was, where, where the Ark of the Covenant was. So why is Jerusalem the most fought over piece of land in history, and why is this particular spot the most fought over and most disputed spot in history? Because the Jews and Muslims and Christians believe that this is probably the place where God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and probably the place where the Ark of the Covenant actually sat in the holiest of holies in the temple. Pretty important spot, right? And without question, somewhere in this area is where the tabernacle was. The likelihood that we figured out that exact spot is pretty slim, I think. But unquestionably, from all the archaeology, we know that it was somewhere in this area for sure. So that's why Jerusalem is such an important spot, why it's fought over so much, why it matters so much to so many people. So what's going to happen here? Again, on this spot, Court of the Gentiles here. So this area here is not what was measured. This area here is not what was measured. This was measured because this is considered the protective place for the Jewish people. Okay, Out here, who knows what kind of nasty things are going to go on during the tribulation, but worship of God will somehow be kept here. At least that's how it appears to me to be. So the temple of God, the altar he measures, it says going on the inner altar, the inner area, is the altar of incense, all right? Now, that's, again, it's really complex stuff. We're still only in, verse, in two verses. That's, not why we're, that's why we're not getting through the chapter today. Let's go back to the illustration of the tabernacle. The tabernacle already, that's the, the tent that was taken through the wilderness, this very small place compared to a football field, okay? The, the altar of incense we saw previously, right, is this here where the, the incense was kept lit and smoking 24-7 because it was where the representation of the prayers of the saints for justice was put so that the lingering scent of that could be smelled in God's presence, right? So this is the altar that he's told to measure. There are two altars. There's the brazen altar here. There's the altar of incense here. The brazen altar is the one that has horns. This is where the those who give their lives to Christ during the tribulation, they are hidden under this altar because when somebody, we talked about this earlier, in the Old Testament, if somebody killed somebody by mistake, they could run and grab onto the horns of this altar and be safe there if they had killed somebody by mistake and their relatives could not take revenge on them. So the brazen altar was where, as you can see here, animals were offered for forgiveness of sins, and where people could run to for safety. Why does this not factor in in this part here? Why is it this one here that they're asked to measure? Here's why. This altar is no longer necessary because we no longer need to offer a sacrifice for sins because Jesus did that on the cross. So when our Jewish friends rebuild the temple, they will probably offer sacrifices in the altar if they don't believe in Jesus as Messiah because they believe that those still need to be all offered for sins. That's not what Jesus is, that's not what's being asked to be measured here in this. It is this altar, the prayers of the saints, the place closest to the heart of God. Okay, so let's move from that. Where are we moving along here? All kinds of cool stuff. So let's move from that now to um, the two witnesses in verses 3 through 14. And I know 
you're probably going, wait a minute, I missed half of that. Yeah, well, I'm good thing it's on video. You can go watch it again. And the parts that I don't explain is probably because I don't get it either. There's a lot that went on in those two verses, wasn't there? Yeah, I know. Okay, let's take a look at the last half of this session and not even the last half of the chapter yet, but the next few verses. Verses 13 through 14, let's take a look at them. Um, or 3 through 14, I mean, sorry. And I will appoint my two witnesses. So we're moving now from the temple, those two verses, to a different situation, two witnesses. I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Remember those that number of days. It's important. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. So 1,260 days without rain. Sounds like California. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Oh, sounds like a fun couple of guys, right? Okay, who are the two witnesses? In verses 3 through 6 that we've read already, the two witnesses were, well, not the two witnesses. The two witnesses are a reference back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy where it says, Two witnesses are required before any fact could be established in a court of law. So anytime a Hebrew heard two witnesses, they knew we're talking about a legal proceeding where two eyewitnesses were required to offer their eyewitness testimony before somebody could be sentenced in a court of law. This was part of God being fair. You couldn't just have one person go, oh, I saw you do that and convict somebody because one person had to hate them. Getting two people to agree to sentence someone to a criminal offense was really, really hard. That's where conspiracy laws even come in. So in order for someone to be convicted of a crime, you had to have a minimum of two witnesses testify against them. So when two witnesses are mentioned here, every Bible understanding Jew knew, oh, we're talking about witnesses in a court of law. We are now talking about a legal proceeding here. So what's happening is they come along and they testify to the validity of God's word. They're dressed in sackcloth because sackcloth is a time of mourning, and they're testifying about the world's sinfulness as recorded in the Bible. They testify for 1,260 days. Why? 1,260 days is exactly three and a half years as measured on the lunar calendar, which is the calendar that they used back in John's and Jesus' day. It's not three and a half years on the solar calendar that we use, but it is exactly three and a half years on the lunar calendar, which tells us the seven years of tribulation will be according to the lunar calendar, not according to the solar calendar. It'll be close, but it'll be a few days different from the calendar that we use today. So who are these two witnesses who are testifying to the validity of God's law, who are doing so to condemn a sinful world, which is why they're wearing sackcloth, and who are going to do it for a full three, a full one half of the tribulation. Some people say this is Elijah, some people say it's Enoch, some say John the Baptist, some say Moses. So I'm going to tell you who I think it is based on this evidence. I think the two key elements of evidence that we've read in verses 3 through 6 are this. It says they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. I believe that the olive trees and the lampstands are what are, are what matter here. And the olive trees and lampstands symbolize a constant flow of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know that? Because Zechariah, uh, I, I'm looking up on my, on, my, um, on my phone here. I forgot to put it in my notes on the computer, so I'll look it up on my phone here. Here we go. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 through 14 say this. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? Olive trees and lampstands, Zechariah 4, that's what this is referring to. Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these mean? No, my Lord, he said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the God of all the earth. So there's a reference in Zechariah to two witnesses, two lampstands, two trees, two olive trees specifically. And as you go through that passage in Zechariah, here's what you discover. The picture is this. The, the lampstand had to be lit constantly. So you constantly had to be putting olive oil in it for the lamps to be lit. How would that change? What if you could hook up 
the lamps that required olive oil to a, an olive tree so that the tree was constantly growing, constantly producing olives, which were constantly producing oil and constantly flowing through a pipeline that Zechariah mentions into the lampstand. So what is being referred to in Zechariah is that the lampstand in the tabernacle and in the temple, which constantly had to be refilled, there will come a day when the oil will constantly be ready and constantly be filled without having to be refilled. When did that begin to occur? Acts 2, day of Pentecost. Holy Spirit comes into us, fills us with his Holy Spirit. And at this point now, we are constantly filled and constantly be, being refilled with the Holy Spirit. So, unlike the Old Testament, where you constantly had to go back into the temple to constantly offer sacrifices for your sins, Jesus offered his sacrifice once for all, so we don't need to do that. And two, being the, the, being the temple in which the Holy Spirit now lives, we are constantly being filled by the Holy Spirit, like we're hooked up to an, an olive tree with olive oil constantly flowing into the lampstand. So this is a reference to that. They will be filled with the Holy Spirit during the tribulation. Remember we talked earlier, one of the reasons I believe in the rapture of the church is because I believe the Holy Spirit has to be removed in order for God's judgment to come. But that doesn't mean that God can't send somebody under the power of his Holy Spirit to be a witness to those who do not have his Holy Spirit. That's how it happened in the Old Testament all the time. So in the New Testament, this is probably two people who come along and who are filled with the Holy Spirit to give this testimony. Now, with all of that in mind, who are they? Well, this prophecy in Zechariah had an immediate or a, an earlier fulfillment that is a clue to this. The earlier fulfillment that there are going to be two witnesses who are, who are going to be speaking uh, and testifying to me were, were, were fulfilled earlier on by Zerubbabel the king in Zechariah chapter 4 and by Joshua the prophet referred to in Zechariah 6. So Zechariah talks about the two witnesses and says they are Zerubbabel and Joshua, the king, the prophet the civic leader, and the religious leader. So if, uh, if Zerubbabel is, a, is the civic leader, the king, and Joshua is the, is the religious leader, the prophet, then it appears that these two witnesses will also be somebody representing a civic leader and a religious leader. So Elijah is one of the nominees, and he's definitely a religious leader. And Moses is another nominee for this, one of the two... Uh, people, and he's a civic leader. It's also interesting that on the Mount of Transfiguration, who appeared with Jesus? Elijah and Moses, right? And guess what else they had in common? They were both people whose bodies disappeared and were not buried. Elijah was taken up into heaven, and the Bible is very clear that the angels took Moses' body. So you've got a civic leader and a religious leader, which matches the Zechariah prophecy. You've got the two people who appeared with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. And you've got two people whose bodies were not buried, but were escorted by heavenly beings. I, or I believe the Bible actually says that the angels took care of or buried. Some translations say buried, but most people believe that that, that means took care of or disposed of or dealt with Moses' body. Either way, they didn't have a normal burial they were their their bodies at the end of their life was dealt with, were dealt with by angels. That's why I believe the two witnesses are probably Elijah and Moses. Does it matter? Not really. It's just kind of an interesting thing to look at. But I do believe one they will testify to the to our sinfulness. They will do so from both a religious and a civil civil standpoint. So it won't just be hey the Bible says it will also be even your own laws testify against the kind of sinfulness that you're committing. So even from a secular standpoint, their testimony will stand and will be strong. So what happens after this? Verse 7. Now, when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. So when their prophecy is done, the Antichrist will kill them. It says that for this entire three and a half years, while their job is still going on, nobody can kill them. They can send fire out of their mouths. Does that mean literal? Almost certainly not. It means they can with their mouths, that is, they can speak destruction to others. Okay, it doesn't mean actual, you know, dragon breathing fire kind of thing. The, the mouth is a symbol for the words that come out of the mouth 
And so that probably simply means that they can speak destruction upon people, upon their enemies when they come until the time designated. And when their prophecy is done, the Antichrist will come along and will kill them. But only after their message is out and only because God gives them permission to do so at this time. And then what happens? Verses 8 and 9. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. It's Jerusalem, but it's Jerusalem in rebellion, which means Sodom, which means Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Obviously, that makes it Jerusalem. This is where Jesus was crucified, right? For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. So they'll be killed in Jerusalem, For three and a half days, their bodies will lie in the street and they won't be allowed to bury them. Why? Why is that? Well, first of all, since they prophesied for three and a half years, they will lie dead in the street for three and a half days. They're going to say, hey, they drove us crazy for three and a half years with all these terrible prophecies. And so we're going to leave them there for three and a half days without burying them. Now, here's the thing. It says people from all walks of life from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies. When this prophecy was given, that was a physical impossibility. People from all over the world could not gaze at bodies sitting in the streets of Jerusalem. Today, internet, no problem. Well, how did John know that? John didn't, but Jesus who gave him the prophecy did, (laughs) right? Because God stands above and beyond time. He knew that that ability would happen, that, that, that we would have that ability by the time this occurred. So, That's what's going to happen. So why aren't they burying them? That is the ultimate sign of disrespect. We're not going to bury you. You're going to lie there. We're going to gaze at you, okay? And what? in fact, not only are they going to have their bodies laying in the street, take a look at this from verse 10. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts. This is going to be like a reverse Christmas, right? Horrible. Because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. Now, how did they torment them? They didn't torment them. They didn't do anything. They said they prophesied. They gave them warnings, and the horrible things they prophesied about did come true. Imagine if, because it it seems as though these two prophets will have prophesied about the things we've already seen in the trumpets. One-third of the trees, all of the grass burned up. One-third of the uh, sea turned to blood. One-third of the fresh water polluted and undrinkable. One-third of the sun, moon, and stars darkened. Locusts and demons coming out of the, the shaft of the abyss. War. All of this happens as a result of the prophecies of the two witnesses. So the two witnesses will be blamed for the events they prophesied. It's shoot the messenger. Okay, So they're thinking, oh, they were the problem. They caused this. Now they're gone. Happy days are here again. They didn't cause the problems. They announced the problems. They gave them warning of the problems. They said, you need to repent before these happen, and they wouldn't do so. So they celebrate when they're gone. Verses 11 and 12. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood to their feet. Can you imagine that, watching bodies rot for three and a half days in the desert heat of Jerusalem? And then they get up. They stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Yeah, I guess so. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now that's some impressive stuff, right? So the resurrection of the two witnesses will be undeniable. It'll happen while everybody's watching them on the internet, dead for three and a half days, so happy that they're dead, that they're sharing gifts with each other. Then God breathes on them, their bodies get up, a voice comes out of heaven and they and they ascend. How many of you have ever heard something like this from like from an atheistic standpoint? Well, if God exists, why doesn't he just declare himself in the clouds? Why doesn't he just speak and say, hey, I'm God? Because he's done it before and he'll do it again, and it doesn't change our minds then either. So not only will the resurrection of the two witnesses be undeniable, the source of the resurrection will also be undeniable. God will speak. Hey, come up here. <laughs> and then they'll be going up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies look on. Now, if that doesn't prove something to you, you're hopeless. I mean, you, if you're going to get it now, you're never going to get it, folks. So how does it continue in verses 13 and 14? Let's finish out this episode. Boy, this has been an interesting one, hasn't it? Wow. 13 and 14. Let's take a look at them. Verse 13. At that very hour. What hour? At the very hour that they're ascending into heaven, a severe was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. So a tenth of Jerusalem collapses. 
7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and finally gave glory to the God of heaven. So after three and a half days, the whole world is watching. They've been exchanging gifts. They're so giddy about this. And then all of a sudden, they start to twitch and they stand up and they're walking around and they're looking around and everybody's gasping. A voice says, come up here. They are carried up into a cloud into heaven. An earthquake hits. 7,000 people are killed in the earthquake. And those who survive finally go, okay, we get it. God, you win. Finally, there's massive repentance that goes on. And this is the point. The purpose of God's judgments is repentance. This is what God wants all along. And then at this point, verse 14 tells us, the second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. Yeah, this is only second woe of three woes. One more woe is yet to come. And when that final woe happens, which is at the blowing of the seventh trumpet, the seven bowls of God's wrath begin. Again, understand this, right? The, the direct... Um, destruction of the world from God is getting more and more severe. First of all, opening the seals and just releasing what has already existed, just releasing sin on the earth. Trumpets announcing there's big stuff coming. And then until finally, we're going to take a look with the seventh trumpet, the bowls, God's wrath is directly poured upon the earth. As amazing as it's been so far, it gets even crazier as it goes along. Hang in there. We got more coming.